All right, well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Thursday morning, 7 a.m. edition of biochemistry. First thing that we want to do with our day is start it off with biochemistry, right, every time. Uh, we are getting to, what, this is week 13, I think, right? This is 13? Yeah. Right? Can I believe it's week 13 already? Yep. You can believe it. Good for you. Um, I cannot. Um, so, obviously, we're getting here to the push of the end, and pretty much everyone I've talked to has been li I'm like, how are you? And they kind of give that, uh, I'm good. You really got to think about it a little bit, right? And they're kind of a little exasperated. Um, so just out of curiosity, like, who, do y'all have a role model? So, do y'all have someone, like, who you, like, really look up to, or, like, a mentor or anything like that? Student mentor? Uh, anybody. Like, I mean, like, professional athlete or uh, someone from your hometown. Like, who, who do y'all look up to? Putting you on the spot. No? Okay. Do you have one? Not to sound cliche, but my dad. Your dad? Mm -hmm. And why him? Because he's a super hard worker and he would like do anything for family mm -hmm. and he supports our entire family. So. That's great. Yeah. yeah so uh, when I have been getting through like the end of the try, I've been trying to like fall back on like my person that I like look up to. Like, who has, like, that work ethic, like, like your father, and, uh, like, I think of my family as well for those reasons. Uh, I'm a big Spurs fan, so uh, I think of, like, Kawhi Leonard, like, especially when I'm trying to do, trying to uh, lift weights in the weight room, I don't really do very well, but I try. You know, just, like, put your head down, just, like, go to work, do it, because you know what's right, and just work hard, because that's what's expected of you, and you'll do better if you just work hard and power through it, then you can enjoy it at the end, right? You win that championship, you get that A, you get that DZ. Exactly. So I guess, yeah, I guess my father is actually a very good example. I just realized I, I got to him yesterday. So. That's great. And so just tell him how I'm, actually everything that he, he told me would happen, happened. So, yeah, it's kind of. It's amazing how they all have the answers now, right? Like, where are those answers later, earlier? Um, so just keep your head down, push, drink water. If you haven't drank water yet this morning, right, you just slept for hopefully eight hours, but probably less. Um, so please drink that water, rehydrate yourself, start that off for the day. And now let's do some DNA and RNA replication, all right? So a lot of this, for those of you who took biology undergrad or uh, really a lot of science, this should be pretty familiar to you. So, and if you didn't take a lot of science in undergrad, then we'll make it easy for you, all right? <coughs> Nucleic acids. Uh, there are three things that make up uh, nucleotides and nucleic acids. These are a board question. It's, a, it's our nitrogenous base, our ribose or deoxyribose sugar, and a phosphoryl group. Those three things. So a phosphate, a ribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. We'll get pictures of those here in a little bit. Our genetic uh, code and all of our genetic information is stored in our DNA and RNA. All right, so the sequences of these nucleotides and nucleic acids is what tells us what proteins that we need to make or what enzymes we need to make or uh, all of our different processes in our bodies. So these are hugely, hugely important. All right, and uh, as we can see here, uh, we, it's also uh, new, where are we at? purines are a part of our ATP and GTP, right? So that adenosine, guanine. Uh, they're a part of our second messengers, the cyclic AMP. They're part of our uh, electron carriers, like our NADH, right? NADPH, all those things. So these are hugely, hugely, hugely important because uh, we pretty much spent the entire previous 15 chapters talking about this, right? Um, and same with our pyrimidines, uh, with our intermediates, our UDP glucose, UDP galactose that we talked about in previous chapters. We've got two different types. We've got uh, deoxyribose nucleic acids, so that's our DNA, and ribonucleic acids, RNA. Uh, like I said, these are the repository for genetic information in cells, uh, is the DNA. So it's stored in DNA. It's expressed in our RNA. All right, and there's a couple processes that we go through to get 
from kind of keeping that information in our DNA and then making it into something uh, expressed in our body. So we go through two processes, transcription and translation. Uh, these are for sure going to be a test question. He's going to ask what is the definition of transcription or he'll give the definition and you'll have to pick if it's transcription or translation. Okay? So we, DNA needs to be replicated. Okay? Right? Our cells uh, only live for so long and we need to replicate our DNA for the next cell. So DNA goes through replication to remake DNA and then from DNA to RNA we go through transcription and then from RNA into proteins we go from translation. Okay, so RNA uh, also most commonly we'll see it as mRNA or messenger RNA is kind of carrying that message from uh, the, the message of uh, what protein to make from the nucleus in the DNA to actually making our protein. Okay, and perfect. Talking about the components of DNA again, like we talked about, need to know, need to know these three uh, for sure. We have our nitrogenous base, so just a base that contains a nitrogen group. It's broken down into two different groups, our purines and our pyrimidines. Uh, which we'll see here at the bottom of the page. So these are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, also uracil, but that's going to be in RNA and not DNA, right? Our deoxyribose sugar and uh, phosphate group. Need to know those three for sure. And here we go, our nitrogenous bases, our purines, our adenine and guanine. For boards, the mnemonic that they use for that is all girls are pure. Um, so that's a way to remember that. Or uh, I just do GAP. GNA are purines. Uh, and our, our pyrimidines are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. So this one's got three for our RNA. And I just remember those, they spell cut. So uh, all girls are pure, if you want to remember the purines. Or I just do cut are the pyrimidines, and uh, that means the other ones are pure, are purines. And really, they're just di a little bit different structurally. All right, so our pyrimidines are going to be more uh, of this uh, benzene type ring with a nitrogen in there, whereas our purines are going to have a little bit more on there. Not that big of a deal. He's not going to ask you, he's not going to show you a structure and be like, is this a purine or pyrimidine? He shouldn't do that. Boards didn't do that. Okay, we can further break down our nucleotides uh, into nucleosides. All right, so a nucleoside is composed of a purine or pyrimidine, any of them, uh, covalently linked with one of these N glycosidic bonds, right? That's all it's saying is it's linked with that nitrogen that's on there, to the pentose sugar. So this is just saying that there is no phosphate group present on a nucleoside. You subtract the phosphate from the nucleoside. Uh, probably that upside down. That's just a disaster. Here we go. All right, and then a nucleotide is just adding that phosphate group on there uh, to the fifth carbon hydroxyl group. That's not really as important, just knowing that the nucleotide has the phosphate group on there. Uh, and then here's a chart that kind of shows that difference. So nucleoside is just base and sugar, subtract the phosphate, nucleotide, uh, add the phosphate group to it. Uh, I think he, on our test, what he did was he um, picked one of these and asked if it was a nucleotide or a nucleoside. Um, so just look at the suffixes and you, it's just similar to what we did with the ribose versus ribulose. For our aldehydes and ketones, just look at the suffices, um, and that'll tell you if it's a nucleoside or nucleotide. All right, and then if it's got uh, adenine or guanine in it, it's going to be a uh, purine. And if it's got cytosine, thymine, or uracil, it's going to be that pyrimidine. Also, if it's got a deoxy in front of it, it's going to be DNA. If it has just a uh, ribose in front of it, it's going to be RNA. That should be. Should we, uh, memorize the I would just memorize the suffixes. 
because um, that's the most functional or practical way to memorize it, right? Instead of just memorizing every single one. And you already know um, what adenine is. Uh, it's a purine. And then, so adding just the ocene, you know it's uh, just a nucleoside. So when it has O, when it ends in INE, it's the side. And when it ends in late, it's our tide. Zoom out just a little bit. All right, and here's just some more pictures of that. Um, so a nucleotide has the phosphate group. Nucleoside would remove the phosphate group. So these are our deoxy. And here's our, for our DNA is on top, RNA is on bottom. Have fun looking at that. This was a board's question, and people missed it because they didn't pay attention uh, in this class. Uh, phosphodiester linkages or phosphodiester bonds are the covalent backbone of DNA and RNA. Okay? Phosphodiester linkages. Okay, and those join the three prime carbon of one sugar to the five carbon of the next sugar. So pretty much we have this sugar backbone for our DNA. And those are phosphodiester linkages. They are covalent, right? We want these to be very, very strong. Yes, covalent is our strongest bond. Um, we kind of don't want our DNA to just kind of spontaneously collapse. That would lead to probably cancer. Um, cool. What was our uh, bonds for the backbone of proteins? Peptide bonds, right? Peptide bonds are the ones that link the different amino acids together, right? The disulfide bonds uh, are the ones between which amino acids? Just cysteine, right? Just cysteine. Methionine doesn't make the disulfide bond, right? So just between two cysteines. Also a board's question. All right, so trying to, we got the final coming up here in a little bit, just trying to tie it back together. Because um, on one of these questions, he'll put peptide bonds, phosphodiester bond, uh, what have you. And so just being able to sort those out at the very end is going to be important. I think the question more is, what's the bond that covalently links the backbone of DNA? And you'll have to be able to pick out phosphodiester. Um, and he, but he also might do three carbon of one to the five carbon of the next. All right, uh, DNA double helix, right? My grandfather got his PhD in chemistry in 1954, 51. While he was doing his masters, Watson and Crick came out with the DNA double helix. So like, when he told me that, that just blew my mind, right? That's just like, oh yeah, like DNA is double stranded, like no big deal. To him, that just like blew the lid off of everything. And uh, pretty much changed uh, the way that he was, that his, he had to teach the information and open up whole new opportunities for research on uh, DNA and, and the human body. So it's kind of like putting in a little perspective. Uh, when we hear cutting edge research, and it's like, oh my god, like this happened, multiply that by 1,000 when we find out that DNA is double stranded in 1950, whatever. Um, so DNA is a double helix. Uh, so it's actually two polynucleotide chains, and they are joined by hydrogen bonds, right? So that's a test question, is that the hydrogen bonds are going to be the bonds that link uh, both strands of the polynucleotide chains together, okay? And they do that by making base pairs uh, between, the, uh, between the purines and pyrimidines, okay? We can, so uh, adenine and thymine make a base pair, and guanine and cytosine make a base pair. 
And based on their structure, uh, adenine and thymine make two hydrogen bonds together, and cytosine and guanine make three hydrogen bonds together. So how I remember putting all these, uh, remembering that A and T go together and G and C go together, and the number of bonds that they have, I do uh, AT2, right, AT2, and then GC3. Okay, so I kind of make it rhyme a little bit. So AT2, GC3. And so then you know which ones always pair with each other. Is the only difference between purity and purity just how they're structured? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and we can also see uh, this AT, if we are in uh, RNA, this would be AU, right? Because you're, so in RNA, uracil replaces thymine. So if you want to remember it AU2 and GC3, if you want to remember it like that, you absolutely could. But for right now, we are in DNA. Uh, just like in, what was it, like in our beta pleated sheet where they ran, uh, or was it a beta pleated sheet or was it in our alpha helix where they ran anti-parallel to each other? I think it was beta pleated sheet. I think it was in a sheet. Um, the DNA runs anti-parallel as well. That is the most stable, is the anti-parallel distribution. So one chain runs from the five prime to three prime, going this way, and then looking at it from that same top down, we go three prime to five prime. Okay, and uh, those, these two chains twist as they do, making that double helix, so it kind of looks like a stair stepper. And what's actually really interesting is that uh, it's not a perfect helix. There's actually uh, major grooves and minor grooves, so some of the grooves are actually bigger than the other. Um, Would that be a GC? Nah, it's kind of more for your own benefit, I think. He might ask you the length of the, ma the major versus minor, um, but we'll get to that here in a second. Uh, so we said DNA is double helical, and we have something called Chargas rule, which he loves and Boards likes as well. And all it's saying is that uh, the number of adenines and guanines, so the number of uh, purines that we have, is equal to the number of pyrimidines that we have. And that's just because uh, a always binds to T, and G always binds to C, or A always binds to U, right? So uh, Chargaff's rule is just saying that um, the number of purines is equal to the number of pyrimidines, which is usually already pretty obvious based on uh, the way that they're binding together. But just Chargaff's rule, he'll say, you'll have to pick out that name, most likely. Okay, so the, as I said, the minor groove is a little bit smaller than the major groove. The minor groove is 0.34 nanometers, and the major groove is 3.6 nanometers. So pretty substantial difference. Uh, and I think the other part that he kind of liked in here too was that uh, the distance between the minor groove and the next minor groove, or how long a major groove is, is about 10.5 base pairs per turn, okay? So that's just saying that there's roughly about 10 and a half of these hydrogen bonds between guanine and cytosine or adenine and thymine going on between the different minor grooves. Uh, He's measuring that in amperes, so. Well, it's this is okay, nanometer, because in the, in, the, in the paragraph it says 3.34 uh, nanometers and then 3.6 nanometers. So maybe I'm, yeah. It, I'm it makes sense that it would be 3.6 and three versus 3.4. Uh, 
Ask him. Do you all have class today? Yeah. Ask him. You're in charge. Yeah. But that makes sense. All right, the DNA double helix, there are three different types. Okay? They got a Nobel Prize for a reason. So we have three different types. We have B DNA, A DNA, and I'll try to stand in the shadow so the sun doesn't show it, and Z DNA. All right, so B is the one that is described by Watson and Crick, and this is the one that is right-handed and has those 10 base pairs per turn. All right, so how I remember this one is B right. Okay, don't be wrong, be right, please. Um, so A DNA is wider and flatter and is a more compact form of the DNA. So A is just it's a little bit uh, wider and flatter. So B right, B like Watson and Crick. And then you know that A is a little bit, is still right-handed, but it's wider and flatter. And then Z is the oddball, it's the one that's left-handed. So Z is left-handed and have base positions towards the periphery of the helix. So I think he asked us, he asked us one of these. Um, so if you can remember B right and you remember that Z is left-handed, then you know what A is uh, by process of elimination. And here's a little bit, here's some pictures. So B form, the Watson Crick, left-handed is our Z, right-handed compact, so it's a little bit shorter, tighter, is going to be our A. Talking about the structural organization uh, of our DNA molecule, we had one of these test questions on here too. So our DNA, when we are not uh, trying to replicate it, is tightly, tightly coiled uh, and bundled up in our nucleus, right? So we're trying, it's kind of like uh, glycogen, where we're trying to make it more soluble, like increase the storage form of it, so we can like have a lot of glycogen stored. What DNA does is that it makes chromosomes, which is pretty much a super coiled DNA molecule. And how they do that is they wrap around these histone proteins. So they wrap around these proteins and just get super uh, tied together so that um, there's space for other activities going on inside the nucleus. And then when it comes time to go through replication or transcription, transcription is going from DNA to RNA, um, they uncoil, unwind, so that the proteins that can come in can, or the enzymes that come in can actually replicate it. So chromosome is supercoiled DNA molecules, and they are wrapped around histone proteins. And that's the big deal is understanding is knowing the word histone proteins. Do you need to know the different forms of histone? I don't think you really need to know the different forms, no. Do you all remember Dr. Sarkar talking about the different forms, really? We were all listening that day. I don't think you did either. Okay, regulation of gene expression. Uh, so these histones are the ones that are playing ooh, uh, a big role. And uh, so gene expression is influenced by the covalent modification of the histone proteins. Like I said earlier, like they, uh, during the expression, they unwind and they uh, reveal the portion of the nucleotide systems. Uh, sequence that needs to be transcribed and that just we, we take out the, the histones that they're coil around. Uh, but here we have when the histones are covalently modified by acetylation so adding an acetyl group to it uh, it relaxes or unwinds the DNA. So we have the enzyme histone acetylase is uh, when the histones are modified allowing the DNA to unwind. We all know how much he loves enzymes. So I just figured I'd underline that for y'all. I don't think he asked that on our test, but I'm trying to pick out some important stuff for you. Uh, 
OK, DNA methylation. Right? What's a methyl group? What is that composed of? CH3, right? We've come so far. Heck yes. I used that joke earlier this week. I'm not ashamed. Uh, so DNA methylation, with the DNA sequence, within the DNA sequence, there are many cytosine, guanine repeats, or CPG islands. OK? Uh, star that word. The presence of CPG islands on the 5 prime end of some genes are related to methylation and regulation of gene expression. Okay, CPG islands. So how I remember that is CPG islands is five syllables, so that's on the five prime end of our DNA, of our genes. Because that's I think he'll ask if it's on the five prime or the three prime end. And uh, these areas have actually lower levels of histones, uh, which means that the DNA packaging on this side is a little bit relaxed. Uh, so that means that uh, gene expression is more favored in these areas, right? Because they're more open to allow uh, enzymes to come in and do that, uh, whatever, if it's uh, uh, transcription or replication. Uh, so we have reversible denaturation and renaturation of uh, DNA, just like we do with our proteins. And uh, it's the same things that are doing it for DNA, right? So changes in pH, uh, ionic bonds being broken, and uh, mild increases in temperature can cause that spontaneous reversible denaturation or renaturation, right? But then for the ones for our extremes, our extreme pHs, right? So if we put our DNA in like acid, right, uh, or superheated it, that would permanently break those covalent bonds, those stronger bonds, and then that would be very bad. And then renaturation, uh, kind of underline this word annealing. I don't know. Renaturation is annealing, uh, whatever. Comes back together. Here's a cute little picture of it. Double helix. Denatures, so say we put it, so we say we get a little bit more acidic, denatures, um, but then when we get back in the proper environment, it's going to anneal back together. Hybridization, this isn't too, too important, I don't think, um, but a single strand of DNA or RNA can pair uh, together and kind of make this mix, uh, this hybrid duplex. Uh, I don't think that's he's, I don't think that's something that's like a test question, but I don't know. Take it a trivia night. Uh, all right, DNA biosynthesis or DNA replication. It is semi-conservative, for sure. Know this term, know this word, pick it out, understand it, like the back of your hand. But uh, each DNA strand serves as a template for the synthesis of a new and complementary strand. So thus, each parent strand synthesizes two, strand, two new strands with complementary base pairs. And there should be a picture. Great. Um, so after, after it's done replicating, each daughter DNA contains uh, one intact strand and one newly synthesized strand. Uh, also, it goes bidirectionally, right? So we have those two strands going in anti-parallel directions we actually replicate in both of those directions. It just makes sense to save time uh, to do it both ways. Okay, so here's a picture form of semi-conservative. So we have our original parent strand in gray. Uh, so these are going to split apart. Each of these is going to split apart and be served as a template. So uh, let's see. We'll pretend that the clicker thing is parent strand number one. That's going to serve the template to make the strand number two, which is going to be the red, and the same thing with the other side. It's going to be the template, and it's going to make another one off of that template. And so our first generation is going to have 50% of uh, is going to have 50% from our original parent molecule, whereas our second generation is going to have 25% from our original parent molecule. I would say it's bi-directionally, 
and most everything is five prime to three prime. Okay, so most everything is from the five prime. It starts on the five prime and then ends in the three prime. Uh, so during the addition of nucleotides, the second nucleotide is added to that three prime. So it goes, it's always added to that three prime OH group, that OH or that hydroxy group. Uh, and then it just is elongated until uh, it's, it's where it needs to go. Also, we have a lagging, <coughs> let's go over here, I like pictures way better. All right, so here's the picture. What happens is the DNA is going to unwind and then kind of allowing the replication to happen, okay, because you can't do a replication when they're bound together. So it's going to go from this five prime to three prime making this new strand. Uh, but we also have this other strand, it's called a lagging strand, and it also goes from five prime to three prime, but it's called the Okazaki fragments, okay. Uh, that's just the weird one. It's like incomplete. It's not as good as the leading strand. It's just not as efficient uh, for whatever reason. And so it kind of like does it in bits. And I think we'll get to how that happens. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, and then at the end, it's kind of like pieced together. Okay, so it's not in one continuous strand. It's in a couple different ones, and then they have to kind of piece it together. DNA synthesis occurs five prime to three prime. It's going to be five to three most likely. Uh, he could ask that for DNA synthesis. He could ask it for RNA synthesis. Um, so just be aware of those numbers. So starting here, in the leading strand, DNA synthesis proceeds by separation of the strands uh, following the unwinding of the DNA helix. Okay, so it's trying to unwind the helix so they can read it and then transcribe uh, the base pairs to match it. Okay, the enzymes, uh, we have a couple different enzymes. DNA polymerase 1 catalyzes DNA synthesis. Okay, test question. So what it does is this enzyme copies and reads the parent strand in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So it reads it, 3 prime to 5 prime, but then it makes it the new strand in that five prime to three prime, right? Because they're going anti-parallel, they're opposite. Okay, so that's just the only place uh, where it's kind of different is that it reads it three to five, but it, the production is always five to three. Production is always five to three. And we can kind of see here. So it's going to go, uh, it's going to read that blue strand and then make the red strand there. Okay, and uh, it requires just a single unpaired template strand, right? So we unwind it to, uh, to make that strand. Uh, it needs all four deoxynucleotides, right? We need the uh, A, G, C, and T to be able to make our DNA, right? So it needs those building blocks, just like uh, proteins needed the, like the, the 20 different amino acids. Uh, and it needs an RNA primer strand. Uh, so this is something that we're adding here, is that it's a primer strand is 10 nucleotides with a free OH group at that 3 prime end, right? So we need that first hydroxyl group to be able to add on to those. And uh, so the synthesis of that primer occurs using that parent DNA template. So it's already, that primer is usually already on that DNA. It's kind of like the methionine of... Uh, of DNA, where the methionine is like that first uh, amino acid, and then that is what uh, creates the protein. It's, that's exactly what the RNA primer is. And here's mechanism of elongation. So the template strand, it's reading it 3 to 5, but we are making it 5 to 3. Pretty simple. Next we have the lagging strand, okay? So the lagging strand is associated with the Okazaki fragments uh, as, the as the replication fork opens, okay? Uh, in the Okazaki fragments, the RNA primers are attached and then uh, repl replication begins going this way. 
Uh, and like we said, that it does have There we go. <laughs> Help if I put the batteries in the right way. Okay, uh, so there are gaps with the Okazaki fragments that are made, and those gaps are filled in uh, with the enzyme DNA ligase. So DNA ligase is like a, well, let's see, um, it's like the, hmm. Say you're doing like a project. My dad builds houses, so I'm gonna use that example. So like, say you're building a house, right? And uh, the painter came in and he painted the walls. DNA ligase is the guy who comes in, checks the work, and is like, oh, like you missed a spot here, and just kind of like patches it up. Okay. Needs to know that enzyme. So DNA ligase patches the spots uh, where the Okazaki fragments weren't able to do, and uh, that's those gaps were left behind because that's where the RNA primer was removed was in those spots. So the RNA primer was there, makes the Okazaki fragments. Next RNA primer is there, makes the Okazaki fragment. DNA ligase fills in that, that missing paint spot. Uh, and here it is in word form. So DNA ligase joins the Okazaki fragments together, completing the complementary chain. Uh, DNA synthesis uses an RNA primer synthesized by RNA polymerase. Okay. And and DNA polymerase, the enzyme that created uh, the new strand, actually is what removes the RNA primer as well. Okay. So in the in the leading strand, in the leading strand, DNA polymerase is pretty much just a badass on the leading strand. All right. It can uh, it can remove that the primer and make just a continuous strand. It's beautiful, like no work. The lagging strand, uh, kind of by its name, it doesn't really keep up. So that's why it needs that extra enzyme to fill in the gaps. So leading strand with DNA, uh, polymerase, awesome. Lagging strand, not so much. DNA helicase, if you can guess by the name of it, is what actually unwinds the DNA uh, ahead of that replication fork. So that's the thing. If you ever see a video for it, it's actually pretty cool. It like, kind of like spins as it goes, because like, it's a double helix, right? Um, so that's what opens it up, and then as uh, it goes, the DNA replicates behind it. So it's pretty cool. So DNA helicase deals with the helix. It unwinds it. That was a test question for us. And topoisomerase, uh, that was not a test question for us. But uh, it acts to prevent the extreme supercoiling of the helix. So topo isomerase is, uh, I don't know. I actually don't recognize this word. Andrew, yes, sir. The topo isomerase, because you're unwinding the helix, you're transferring the whisk from the helix itself to the strands. And so at some points, it actually needs to like cut, let the, chain, the individual chains free spin until they release the tension, and then come back together. That's pretty cool. Cool. Did y'all hear that? No. no? The topo isomerase actually um, allows the, uh, takes the tension out of the single strands because when you unwind the helix, you transfer the, the twist from the helix to the individual strands. And so the super coiling that he's talking about is that these individual strands themselves would become so coiled that they would 
um, break or have trouble replicating. So the topoisomerase takes the tension out. It'll actually like cleave a phosphodiester bond, let it free spin until it releases the tension, and then put it back together. That's legit. Cool. If y'all want to just like Google that a little bit later, uh, please do. Dr. Sarkar didn't like hammer on this one, uh, so I'm not an expert in this on this one enzyme. But we do have experts, which is great. That's why I love Parker University, right? Um, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, DNA mutation. Uh, so that's when we have permanent changes to our DNA. Uh, not good, right? When we get our DNA mutations. Um, this can lead to uncontrolled cell growth or um, the creation of poor uh, enzymes or protein molecules, which can lead to cancer or other types of uh, disease with us. And these are made uh, either with uncorrected errors during replication or via damage, like radiations, toxins, chemicals, right? So we talk about uh, toxins, thought, trauma leads to subluxation, right? Or our inability to adapt to them, right? As Dr. Russell says, really those three don't cause them. It's our inability to adapt to them. Okay, so it's kind of the same thing, right? Our DNA is our inability to adapt uh, correctly to these changes in our sequence. Um, and like we said, like radiation. So if we get too much sun, right? A lot of people develop skin cancer. The same, it's, it's just the same concepts. So we have three different types of mutations, and he's going to ask you about them for sure on the exam. And uh, boards might actually ask you about them on the exam. So we have point mutation, which is the substitution of just one base for another. All right, so DNA polymerase reads it, and it reads, it's going so fast, it reads a G as a C. Okay, so it just replaces uh, that one base for another. Then we have an insertion mutation where it, there's the addition of one or more nucleotides within a DNA sequence, okay? Uh, so that's, so over here, we'll say we've got like three adenines in a row, uh, but it'll insert two thymines in the middle of it just by accident. So it's inserting something. And then, yes? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, there are four. Uh, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do the nonsense after the deletion. Uh, so we have our deletion mutation, which is the removal of one or more nucleotides from the DNA sequence. All right, so that would be if we start out with three A's and then you cut off the last one, right? So it just read it and it didn't add that one in. Uh, then the fourth one is our nonsense mutation. Um, and nonsense mutation is going to be, I think, the worst of all the different types of mutations. Is that correct, people who have taken this before? Yeah? So what a nonsense mutation does uh, is it pretty much just gets it all wrong. Um, and it puts a stop code on, uh, on the DNA. And so pretty much, instead of having this beautiful gene that can uh, you know, create, uh, let's say, hexokinase for us, right? Uh, it actually just does like the first couple lines of code, and then it just puts a period on it and says, I'm done. Uh, those, those are bad. So that's the nonsense mutations are the worst ones that can happen. Okay, I think that was actually a test question. Uh, people missed it because I guess it's, it wasn't in the book. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, last page, and we'll, we'll be done here. Uh, DNA repair, right? So uh, we have, what, like 75 trillion cells in our body? Something like that, okay? Um, chances are DNA polymerase is going to get it wrong maybe a few times out of that, right? But actually, it's very, very, very effective and efficient with its job. But just in case uh, there is an accident in the coding, 
with either an in a insertion or deletion or, um, or a point mutation, there's steps in that can go back and fix it. All right, innate intelligence, right? It can say like, hey, there's a problem. Uh, I can go back and fix it. So there's a few steps. Uh, the first is the removal of that segment of DNA that uh, has a damaged portion. So we're gonna take out that DNA with the enzymes exonuclease or endonuclease, okay? Uh, then DNA polymerase, the enzyme that created the DNA in the first place, is gonna fill the gap with what it should have been. Uh, and then it's going to, and then uh, ligation of the newly synthesized segment to the remainder of the chain. So it's gonna tie it all back together, uh, sew it up nice and neat. There are four different enzymes for DNA repair. Uh, we have endonuclease, exonuclease, DNA polymerase, DNA ligase. Um, so endonuclease uh, recognizes the DNA, probably lesion and not lesions, uh, removes the affected base and leaves behind uh, an apurinic or apurinic site known as the abasic site. I don't think he really harped on this one very much. I don't think he really harped on exonuclease as much. Uh, he did focus on these two. Uh, whereas DNA polymerase is involved with the synthesizing of the deoxynucleotide polymers and also with DNA synthesis by adding and elongating the DNA chain and then DNA ligase is the one that uh, closes the nicks or the gaps of the phosphodiester backbone. So DNA is going to fill in the actual sequence and then ligase is going to tie it all together. And that's chapter 16. And I checked with uh, IT this morning, and this is this was recorded for those of you who showed up late. Um, and Ashley is in, I think, London right now. Uh, so I'll see if Bill can get that sent out. Apparently, that uh, try one listserv that Bill sent it out to was not all of y'all are on that. So we'll have to figure out what's wrong with that. But uh, are there any questions while I'm here? Comments, concerns, questions from the test that y'all took on Tuesday? Cool. All right. Uh, do we want to...